get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have one of my favorite people, John Rulin. He is number one all-time distributor of Cutco knives in the 65-plus year history of the company. Very important, he's the author of Giftology, the art and science of using gifts to cut through the noise, increase referrals, and strengthen retention. John, of course I'm gonna read the subheadline because you spent probably hours and hours crafting that. He's the master gift giver who forges lifetime relationships while generating huge returns for his clients, who some of you have heard of, Chicago Cubs, Orlando Magic, Chicago Bears, top entrepreneurs like Darren Hardy, Cameron Harold, and many more. And the true essence of John Rulin can be summed up by a quote from a very important person, John. And this person said, John Rulin helps people love on people. So, John, thanks for joining me. Oh, man, you're going to go right to the heart and the core of uh, me with that with that quote. man. So I, who I, is I, an important I, person that I'm talking uh, about? Uh, I have three daughters under five. Yeah. And uh, my oldest uh, is Reagan. And... That's how she describes it when she talks about what her dad does. Uh, we talk a lot about solving problems. And how did that come it, up? I, I think I I asked her like, so what does dad do? You know, every day and and uh, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, and, how old is how old's the oldest? A five. Five. Okay. Yeah, and um, you know, you always hear like you you don't really um, know what you do unless you can explain it to, you know, a sixth grader. And so I'm like, well, I wonder if I could explain what I do so that a, you know, a five-year-old could understand. So we have conversations about what dad does with gifting and helping solving problems. And right. that's, how, that's how you make money. You solve problems. And so my daughter like yeah. is now coming home saying, Hey dad, I solved a problem today. And, mm. um, which is, you know, really, really it's like, cool. Give me, is she asking for money? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's like, you know, she you know, sees something on TV and so she now understands that you don't just get money, like you you earn money through solving problems and people pay you, sometimes they pay you, sometimes yeah. they don't. And uh, so I asked her one time, like, you know, after explaining it a number of times, what does dad do? And she's like, uh, you know, dad, you help people love on people. Mm. And uh, I'm like, man, if that's... Uh, wow, know. that should be the sub-headline of somewhere on your website. I mean, I, I, don't you agree? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've thought about putting it on there. Although I have, it depend upon who you're talking to. Like I tell people, like love well, or I help people love on their most important relationships. Like you know, never before has have been people been more comfortable using the word love in business. Mm. But there is like still a weird like sounds a little too <laughs> warm and fu- a little too warm and fuzzy. Like is this for real? Is there like this? Is this like a cult? Like. Um, and so like, I, I probably will incorporate it somehow. I do yeah. definitely when I speak, uh, um, I don't know if that's how you, if it's prefaced out. with my daughter said, you know, if, if it just says John Rulin helps people love on people, it sounds weird, but I feel like my five-year-old daughter described me as I help people love on people, you know, yeah. that, that would put it so, in context. The, the, the a little context. Bit. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes, that, that makes total sense. So I, I, um, I probably, yeah, I definitely use it verbally, but I haven't uh, I haven't put it on any websites or anything any, anywhere, but it still warms my heart when yeah, I hear it. Yeah, I love it. And it really does sum up what you do, and people should check out, you know, Giftology. I had the opportunity to read it. It's fantastic. And, um, you know, I always like to include a fun fact, John. We're going to get a, into a lot of great stories which you have. And fun fact, there's a few. Um, one is your mom and wife's mother are one of 13 kids. And you have 65 first cousins on one side. Um, yeah. And another fun fact is you almost died proposing to your wife, which I don't even know if we're going to talk about that. Maybe pe- maybe if people listen to the end, maybe we'll talk about it, maybe not. Um, but the other one is you grew up one of six kids. So big families, what was it like growing up one of six kids? Well, like anybody, like no matter how you grow up, you don't really know any different. So it just kind of seemed like the normal thing. Yeah. We grew up out in the middle of nowhere, 
uh, 500 person town, 50 acres. And so you're um, like 10 percent of the town. <laughs> you're just. Yeah. Family. Yeah. Just our family is like 10 percent. So of the town. what where are you in that birth order in the sense? I'm uh, well, it's a blended family. So okay. I have half brothers, step brothers, you know, full sister. Yeah. Um, but we are a very tight family. And I was like I was second oldest, but I probably in many ways because of family dynamics, I was more like the oldest. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I had a four year old brother, but yeah. we worked. I mean. You want to talk about work ethic and hustle? Like, yeah. We, what was uh, it like? Well, I, I grew up every or I, I woke up every morning and milked goats, like literally, like milk by hand, like not with a machine. Like we milked goats every morning. We had a one acre garden, which like most people are like one acres is a lot to mow. If you've ever hoed a garden <laughs> or hoed anything, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I did. like, um, like I have blisters and like, oh, pickles, yeah. you know, like 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 weeding for like hours, and you know, like in the middle of the summer, like in the Midwest, like. It gets kind of hot and humid, and like yeah. we heated our whole house with wood. So like literally, like not like hey, we have a, a decorative fireplace. Like we had a wood stove in the basement that when it went out, like you'd wake up in the morning, the house would be cold as you know. I, I don't want to use the words. Um, yeah. And uh, it was it was it was. I mean, not that we like we weren't slaves, but we like we learned that <laughs> like, if you wanted to be a part of this family, like you have to contribute. Right. And like there's no. Like, you know, like when you have animals, you don't take the day off like the animals need to eat and the animals like if the yeah. water's frozen, you got to go break the ice. And I'm curious uh, about that growing up in that household. What's what's discipline like? Is it just expected or was it was it very strict? Um, I mean, there was I, I would say at some level, my mom was, um, you know, she grew up one of 13. So she understood pecking order and making sure that things were dialed in like. Anytime you take six kids anywhere, like I take three now and it's like, it's a madhouse. And so like, yeah, it was one, you didn't leave the house very often. But if you did, you were expect like if you got the look like you knew you were going to get in trouble at home kind of thing. Like um, there's there's definitely like um, it wasn't you're in time out. It was like you're going to get paddled when you get home well, if, you, yeah. if you step out of line. So like um, but it, my mom was she's great. I mean, she she was. I could yeah. see if you can stick out among six kids and learn, probably learn from from your mom who's one of thirteen. It's like almost in your nature to try and stick out. And like the 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 you know the ruling group dot com. What I noticed is the the subheadline is obviously, do you want to stand out? Do you struggle to stand out? And that's a big thing about giftology. Yeah, it's all about standing out. I think that that uh, you can stand out in a negative way. And I chose to be the overachiever and, and try to stand out in a positive yeah. way. So, like, I was – even though an entrepreneur, I'm also, like – I got straight A's from kindergarten through 12th grade. Yeah. Like, I was like I was a hustler. I was, like, if I was going to do it, I, I liked – I think I liked the praise. Um, and so, like, I'm somebody yeah. that uh, – love language is words of affirmation. So I sought that out. And so I stepped out of line occasionally. But in general, like, I was – I wanted positive feedback, not negative Yeah, feedback. yeah. And we're going to get into the stories because, you know, one thing about reading your book, John, is my creative juices get flowing. So I love hearing the creativity and the things that you help people do and that you do yourself. Um, but I'm curious, from early on, when you were growing up, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, I, I didn't want to work with my hands. So I wanted to. <laughs> You're like the opposite <laughs> of all the blisters I got. Yeah, yeah. Like if it, if it involves like not having to, to sweat my butt off, uh, bailing hay and feeding yeah. animals every day. It's a good lesson uh, to learn though. Yeah, yeah. no. So I, with grades and being poor, like I thought I'd go be a doctor. Um, my mom was into health and wellness. Mm-hmm. She was mm-hmm. like having bread shipped in from like Stan Evans, like whole wheat bread. We had really? whole wheat, buckwheat pancakes. She was bringing in nature sunshine. So I, I was going to go be a DO mm. or a chiropractor or something yeah. in that category to like one, make more money. One, work with my head and not my hands. And, uh, and two, make my mom, you know, three, make my mom proud. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, I was pre-med going into yeah. to college. Yeah. Uh, and then was, something happened. Yeah. You, well, you saw you, one of your friends doing really well. Yeah. Well, one, I, I had started a business working with my hands, but I was making $40, $50 an hour. That was the cable company. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I fell off the ladder two different times, got lucky, didn't get hurt. I landed in mulch. I'm like, you know, I'm a person of faith. And so I'm like, God's trying to show me something. You're like, this is like, John, you're, yes. like, you're never going to make it through school. So I, yeah, a buddy of mine was, uh, one buddy had put himself through school um, selling knives. And I thought it was the weirdest thing ever. And then another buddy from college who I went to high school with 
was the most anti-salesperson on the planet. He was a seminary major, like, you know, he was going to go do youth ministry. And he started selling. I'm like, he, he couldn't sell ice to an esc. He couldn't sell, like, you know, water to a person on fire. Like, there's no, like, this is not. <laughs> and uh, his name's Steve Wiggers. He's, he's an amazing human being. But when he started to sell it and actually sold it, I was like, it was like this weird, like, this just, like, I'm in another world. Like, this doesn't even, like, that. Right. This can't well, how was that? Did you ask him, like, how did he sell? Um, well, I did. And he's like, people, I showed, I follow the program. I hmm. meet with people. He just sticks he, to the program. He stuck to the program. He did the, yeah. did the appointments. He was, um, and I think, you know, he came from an affluent background. His family was successful and he was seeing successful people. And he's hmm. a super nice guy. He was hmm. well known in the community. And so I think that the you know, odds were in his favor from a family perspective. Right. But it still like boggled my mind. But if after like a couple weeks of hearing him come home with like thousand dollar knife sales, I'm like, if he can do it, I can try. So I'm like, so I, I committed to give it six weeks. That's kind of the bottom line. Is I, I you know I wore my glasses, looked smarter. I wore my one tie, and went in for the interview. And I'm like, here goes nothing. Like, you know, even though my mom thought I was crazy, she you know, and she's like, none of our friends can afford this cutlery. I said, what the, you know, what the heck? What was the biggest learning you had from going through the training? And because doing face to face sales is, is not easy, but you learn a lot. So I'm curious, oh. of, yeah, what did you learn from, from that? Well, I think you learn how to make people feel comfortable. Like, I think a lot of times mm. in sales, like you, um, you know, you're in a lot of situations with a lot of different personalities. And right. I think that one of my skill sets, even though I never considered myself really a salesperson, yeah. is understanding. Uh, being able to empathize and being able to make somebody feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, and I think that when you're sitting in somebody's kitchen table and they've never met you before and their kids are there and it's late at night and they just really want to go to bed and they set this appointment, you, like you learn how to make, you know, you right. learn how to f have fun. You learn how to handle objections in a way that doesn't make them feel pressured. Um, and so I, I brought coloring books. I brought food to chop up. I brought dessert mm -hmm. to have. I cooked people dinner. I made it like fun and lively. And because of that, I think that people yeah. really appreciated that, that element of it. I think you mentioned something really important, which is objections, right? Even in our day-to-day -day lives right now, we have to overcome objections. What was one thing that you found worked really well? Because it's not like you're a high-pressure, pushy person. So I'm curious from your standpoint, what, what worked well with overcoming objections? Well, I think that understanding that um, you can't handle an objection that isn't said. And I think a lot of times people get, you know, somebody that's not experienced in sales was like, as soon as they hear an objection, they think that's a bad thing. And really what they're doing, like when they're actually helping you by sharing mm. what's really in their heart and mind. So they're really saying like that everybody has that, like what's going on in their head and most yeah. people share it. And so I think understanding that objections are good. That means... Mm that they're being honest with you. That means that they're actually sharing. And I can handle, I could handle any objection that got brought up. And sometimes it, it was, it was, this isn't a fit for you. Like if, yeah. you can't put, if you can't put food on the table, you shouldn't be buying high end knives. Right. Like even if you want to buy them, like it would be stupid for you. Like right. go like, um, but I think because we qualified our leads really well, like, and because I had fun with people, and I was able to handle the objections, no matter what came up, I was able to handle yeah. things. We sold nine out of every ten people that we sat in front really? of. Really? Wow. Um, before I even got into the business side of selling to companies, um, yeah, because we qualified people, we we had fun, <coughs> we did our homework. You know, you're good at you understand that a lot of the interview takes place, you know, days or weeks ahead of. You, know, you had to be prepared. And yeah. so when I went into most situations, I knew what they liked. I knew what yeah. the kids' names were. I brought over coloring books. Um, I knew that they liked nice things. I knew that they entertained all the time. Um, so I could go in and talk specifically to them. And they're like, wow, I had no interest in knives. And all of a sudden now, like, I, I don't understand how I lived without these knives. <laughs> like, like an hour later or two hours later. And, and, um, and not in a sleazy, like, you know, like boiler room kind of uh kind of way like i'm sitting the same way i would with you like i'm i'm, I'm having dinner right we're talking we're talking about 90 percent of things aren't even knife related but when we do talk like yeah uh, yeah we, we were able to handle those yeah objections. i mean that, that's a good one you know bringing up objections or like overcoming objections but like you said actually bringing up objections that they may be thinking that they're not going to say because most people aren't going to say them and that's important too when did you transition john from 
okay, most people are going, you know, into people's homes and you had a realization of going to companies. Yeah, well, I think um, I was fortunate. I had a mentor early on in my career. I was 20 years old. I was dating a girl at the time, not the girl that I ended up marrying. Uh, but I'm really thankful that we were dating because her dad was an attorney. But I noticed when you're poor, you notice one, generosity. Two, you, like, I wasn't connected. And every deal seemed to flow his way. Like, hmm. he was an attorney, but he also owned real estate. And then all of a sudden, that real estate would become the huge development in the area. And then he... Uh, Somehow was asked on the bank board and he owned part of the bank and oil wells. And so I remember like thinking, well, Paul's always giving away things like find a deal on noodles and everybody yeah. would end up with like a year's supply of noodles. Well, I'll pitch him the idea of pocket and I saw his clients. And so one, he had bought a set for each of his daughters Two, like he ended up going, coming back to me and challenging me and saying, John, um, could we engrave the paring knives? And I'm like, that's weird. Why would you give paring knives to mm. grown men that own companies? <laughs> right. And he explained to me, like, the inner circle. I got to take care of the whole family. Everything else takes care of itself. So early on in my career, I saw the power of generosity, but I also saw the power of talking to business owners. So even though I was selling in homes, I would say, I wouldn't say, who do you know that likes knives? Because in their head, they're thinking nobody. I would say, who do you know that owns a company? That's how I asked for referrals. Why well, mm. get a list? I averaged. That's really 10, smart. Yeah. I, I averaged 10 leads per appointment of people that own businesses. Because you asked well, the right question. Because I asked the right question. Mm. And, um, and so one, I'm talking to people that appreciate quality. Most business owners like nice things. And two, if I could sell them on me and on the product, now I could go back to them and sell them knives for their business, yeah. uh, for their employees, for their clients, as a, yeah. as a business tool, not as a gift, as a business tool. Um, but my sales doubled because I was seeing people that could afford nice things. You know, business owners, entrepreneurs tend to be affluent or at least have access to uh you know or an appreciation for nicer things so it was like a double it was a double win yeah yeah uh, and even if i didn't sell them anything i sold them on me and now i have a network of a thousand business owners that let me into their home even if they don't buy you bond if they let in your their kids are running around you and yeah uh, exactly i mean i can call them 10 years later and be like yeah we remember sitting down yeah like i mean it was like it was like a built-in network of People, if I decided to go get a real job, um, now I have people that like and trust me that know that I can sell. Yeah. Uh, so it was like an insurance policy of like, if I, if this all goes to hell in a handbasket, at least I got a bunch of people that own businesses that like me and trust me and know I can help. So John, you went pre-med, <coughs> right? So yeah. what did you do after college? Huh? Were you just doing so well that you're like, forget this doctor thing? Or Yeah, I did. I, I kind of was thinking that as I was mm. going to school, um, I started to have to hire people and was speaking and mm. it's like, I'm going to, to be a doctor one, cause I want to impress you know, my mom and I, I like right. health but really yeah. in many ways I was doing it for the wrong reasons. I was like, it was kind of a money thing. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, I, I I'm getting to talk to people. I'm getting to make good money. Right. I get to control my own schedule. Why would I go be a doctor? <laughs> right. um, go talk to a doctor, right? Yeah. Like, go talk to a doctor. Like, like yeah. 10 years later, then you'd be, practicing doing, doing what i want to be doing and yeah. i'm like and you know a quarter million dollars in debt and i was like i'm just gonna see if this <laughs> this gifting thing has some legs yeah and so i ended up i you know i decided i'll give it another year out of out of school and i never looked back i, I was you know like it was 10 15 years ago yeah now i'm so curious you know when i did the introduction so I'm going to jump around for a second because I'm so curious. Obviously, I'm in Chicago, so I'm I'm curious of how you got the Chicago Cubs as a client. Yeah, well, it was uh, like seven years in the making. Um, seven years. Yeah, it took seven years. Some of my it seems to be like a lucky number seven. Like some of my best relationships, the largest home builder. Were you a country. baseball fan growing up or anything? <coughs> I played baseball, okay. you know, little league, up until like they started throwing curveballs in like freshman year of high school, and I'm like, I can't hit that the same. <laughs> I, mo I moved on to basketball and stayed with basketball. That was, um, but I have an appreciation for sports. I mean, you yeah. grew up a boy in Ohio, like yeah. you have an appreciation for sports. Um, and so, the, one of the reasons I got the Cubs was because I had 20 other pro sports franchises I had worked with, so I was yeah. kind of in the industry. Yeah. Two, I was speaking. But it still took you seven years, though. It took seven years. So I met at a NASCAR event. NASCAR, I had a couple of NASCAR clients. I met this guy at this, it was called Burgers and Beer. And this guy named Bobby D, um, who is a, a big wig um, and connected it with, uh, with Callaway Golf, like he hosted this thing at, at Daytona every year. And so I met 
a guy who is at the, at the time, Time Warner. And we hit it off and we chatted for a little bit. We exchanged information. Well, he then went to the, the Cubs mm. and he was from Chicago. So we stayed in touch and I pitched him the idea of different things. And then I'd see him at, at conferences where I was speaking at, at all these pro sports teams were at. And eventually, like I was showing them knives and different things. And um, he came back to me eventually and said, hey, we're redoing Wrigley Field. Iconic structure. We want to do something that's unlike anything that's been done before. Yeah. And we have this wood from the locker room. Mm. And so we want to make a gift that incorporates the wood from the locker room. So we have mm. 400, 400 relationships. You know, they're sponsors. They're sweet owners. They're people that can afford anything that they want. So we can't, like, give them something trinkety. Right. And, and so I, he said, come up with an idea. Like, and I, so I said, well, we have this speaker company we work with. What if we made a, a speaker, like a Bluetooth speaker out of the wood? Um, and he said, you know, they were like, yeah, that's perfect. Headphones or speakers? And so the, this actually is, is one of the headphone companies. Hmm. Um, and so I went to, back to the speaker company. And they're like, yeah, we can't do that. I'm like, oh, I've already talked to the Cubs. <laughs> and they want to do this project. So we end up going to a, a, a secondary supplier. And so we bought the speakers, ripped them apart, ripped the wood out, because they were made out of wood as well, and reformed this Wrigley Field wood, wow. routed it out, and created these iconic – Bluetooth speakers that they are like literally like they're like John we don't know how we're gonna outdo ourselves next year like we have other pieces of Wrigley Field ripped down the brick ivy or something yeah the yeah like I, I'm not sure what we're so gonna they're do. gonna send a gift every year I th- yeah normally yeah. they do yeah yeah normally they do. so this year we're trying to figure out what that next you know piece of Wrigley history that we're gonna weave into a gift and and so I think there's more and more companies that and, and teams that have if they have a historical structure or something that's historical about their building or their product, yeah. you know, weaving that into the, the gift, I think is going to become more and more a part of what we do. So at that point you had 20 pro sports teams. What was the first big one that you remember kind of pumping your fist with? Well, the first one that we landed ever was Roush Fenway, the, the NASCAR driving t- the team. And they also own Fenway Sports Group, which owns the Boston teams. Mm. And they also uh, were involved with Miami. Um, and so I, I actually, the girl, the guy who introduced me to my wife was at the seed corn company. He left and went to, to NASCAR Scott's the big lawn care company. And, um, and we had this great relationship and he's like, John, NASCAR is like perfect for you. All these fortune 1000 companies, they're all entertaining people and they all suck at gifting. They're all giving this like overbranded swag. So he teed us up to, to Roush Fenway cause they were sponsoring the team. And so we ended up doing gifts for. And we ended up doing the knives for like one of their CMO summits, like where all the CMOs of like Coke and Pepsi come. Mm. And it That's went a big really, one. It was massive. And then the at one of the dinners, I met this the chief financial officer, and followed up with him, sent a gift to his assistant, and then magically they left um, the NASCAR side and went to became the CFO of the Miami Dolphins. Mm. And so our first NFL team ended up coming from. You know, the assistant became such an advocate. She took it around to every division head of the Dolphins and showed off the gifts that we did for her. So what type of things? That, I mean, cause you say very casually, yeah, I sent a gift to her assistant, but it was more than just a gift to the assistant. What, what kind of things did you do? Well, I, I'm a big believer in whatever you send to the executive, you should send to the inner circle at the same level or even more because they're usually treated like pawns. They're not respected. <coughs> yeah. And so... Anytime I'd send a knife or a leather good or whatever to the You don't executive. just send a gift. That's why I say like when I receive a note from you, it's on like a metal a metal slate that's written and I like just have it there to remind me I'm slacking off if I don't if I don't uh, Yeah, I still have that note. I think you yeah. sent it a couple years ago, yeah. Um but you just don't send send any small just thing, anything. So, yeah. No, I mean it's personalized with their name, it's yeah. world you know, whether it's a knife yeah. or a of speaker, it's best in class. It's personalized. It's they. It's packaged well. It, it you know, yeah. It has a, a handwritten note for yeah. me. So, what did you end up sending that that lady? Um, I sent a couple. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I, I sent a couple knives and said, uh, "Hey, I hear your you know your so and so's right hand person. He speaks really well of you. I um at some point in time, I'd love to carve out some time to uh, to to chat about you to chat with you and see if we might be able to help you with some of your challenging situations related to gifting. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, she responded right away. She's like, "Oh my gosh, this is beautiful. I took it on my husband. He thinks it's amazing. How did you find out his name?" Um, like she flipped. How did you um, find out his name? 
Um, I, saw, I asked. Uh, I actually asked the executive. I said, hey, I want to do something really nice for your assistant. Mm. She's, uh, and, um, and oftentimes I'll ask the assistant, hey, I want to do something really nice for so-and-so. Uh, don't tell them. Like, can, you know, but other times I'll find out on Facebook right, right. Uh, or LinkedIn or articles, depending upon how prominent the person is. I mean, yeah. in 2016, people are pretty open with their information. Yeah, yeah, and for so sure. So it's, it's usually pretty easy to find if you want to do the homework. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, John, with that, the I'm curious what the most outrageous and craziest gift you've ever given. Um, recently, we gave um, somebody that, uh, that, you know, I felt like, one, I really enjoyed being on their show. Two, um, the person who made the referral I wanted to make sure that they looked really good because they kind of stuck their neck out for me. Um, and three, the conversation came up about what my morning routine was, which included a sauna. And he kept bringing the sauna up in the conversation. So I sent him a sauna. And that was John Lee Dumas, Entrepreneur on Fire. A sauna. I, I sent him a sauna, um, which the funny part is, and most people would get disappointed with this, he, I sent him this custom wooden postcard that let him know a sauna was in, on its way, going to arrive in two weeks. And he called me immediately and said, John, this, this is amazing. Is this for real? And I said, of course it's for real. Like we talked about it like on the show multiple times. And uh, he said, John, I live in a two bedroom <laughs> condo where I do my show. I, I'm on the water in San Diego. I don't have room for a sauna. But that's amazing. I said, well, whenever you move to another place, um, you have a rain check. I'll just delay the sauna. We'll just hold on to it. And he said, man, you're crazy. OK, that's amazing. And then he calls me an hour later. He's like, John. They have this idea. What do you think? He's like, my dad, I'm from Maine. It's cold as heck in Maine. My dad would love a sauna. I'm sure he would love a sauna. Can I surprise him with the sauna? And I'm like, sure, we'll put the sauna wherever you want the sauna at. He's like, I'll use it when I go back home. And sure enough, like we redirected his dad. Every time they talk, all they talk about is the sauna. John now gets to use it. But he's like a rock star to his dad by, right. you know. Like that makes his, perfect yeah, sense. Like, why in San Diego? You want it in Maine, right? Yeah. You want it in Maine. So, so yeah, the sauna's in Maine, and he's fired up. And, and now, he, you know, he can't forget about me because his dad's talking about me every time <laughs> they, 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 they have a conversation. I love that. That's awesome. What about most exciting client that your client landed because of a gift? Because, I mean, <coughs> you're helping these, these big companies get clients. Yeah. What were, what were you most excited about that, you know, second degree of separation you helped with? Yeah. Um, I don't know if, if, if I don't share the story as often, but the one of our clients was targeting Target, the big the executives there. And, and um, they were entrepreneurs. They were former Fortune 500 executives. They wanted to go after they only had a limited pool of people that would change their business. So they wanted to go after Target. And they said, John, we'll give you anything. We'll give you a stock in the company like we need these meetings and this one in particular. So we did research, found out that he lives in Minnesota, went to undergrad and got his MBA from the University of Minnesota. So I'm like, that's the angle. And so we you just took, spot these things. Yeah. yeah I mean, like you that, just, yeah. yeah, you just kind of know, yeah. like alma mater is a big thing for a lot of people. So we took this like 50 inch plasma piece of wood. We carved in the fight song mascot, the gopher and the fight song lyrics and then tied in why they wanted to meet with the fight song lyrics into this note. And sent it off to the the, uh, the president of the electronics division, multi billion dollar division, his office. And within 24 hours, the assistant had called back and said, "I don't know who you guys are. I had to get a dolly to get this thing in and out of the office. Like <laughs> that was insane. Uh, whatever you want to talk about, uh, I, I got 30 minutes for you next Tuesday." Now the challenge is they end up getting the meeting, and, and but they were like eight years ahead of the schedule of they were on the cutting bleeding edge and so right target up, wasn't ready for it is what you're saying the, the, the industry wasn't ready it was mm. the um if you've seen in the last five years where like um best buy has the automatic buyback program where if you buy a tv and then want to trade it up within a year they'll give you a set amount up front mm. they were talking about this like 12 years ago mm. and so the industry like buying back iphones and all that kind of stuff was like now it's a huge industry at the time, they had built the software, and they were just—they were too ahead of the curve to, uh, to to make it happen. But it yeah. got the meeting that they needed to have happen, which yeah. uh, which was exciting right. for us. Yeah, um, the stock turned out to be worth nothing. But <laughs> it was still fun, nonetheless. That is fun. You get to do some fun, creative things, you know. And you mentioned John, your your friend who went to NASCAR, um, yeah. who introduced you and your wife, and you mentioned 
that he's like, you got to come down here because all these companies do everything wrong, big swag. And I know you have like 16 mistakes that people make when they're giving gifts. And I still think about like, I, you know, from listening to you and watching what you have to say, I still think about some of those rules that you have. So could you mention a few of those big mistakes that, that people make that may, they may not even know they're making them? Yeah, I think one of the biggest ones is um, we do things in business that we'd never do in our personal lives. And one of the most I- immediate ones that comes to mind is you never go to a wedding and like you're, you're going to get like I have on the registry a Tiffany's vase or whatever it is that's on the registry. You'd never engrave like compliments of Jeremy Weiss. Uh, if and, you were and, still getting married, I would definitely send just, that just, to you. You'd send, <laughs> yeah, that would be I would laugh. I would laugh and laugh. So I'd be like, what the heck am I supposed to do with it? But, but people do that in business all the time. They right. make the gift all about themselves, yeah. which is a promotional item. It's swag. It's, it's, maybe it's marketing, but if you actually want the other person to feel appreciated, to feel loved, to actually use the item, you have to put their name on it, their yeah. logo on it, um, not your own. So it has to be all about the recipient, not about the brand. Yeah. Um, uh, I see a lot of people that are like, yeah, we're best in class car company. We're world class consulting company. Um, and then they, they, for some reason, the gift, they think it's okay to be mediocre. Right. Like, hey, we're world class over here, but uh, our relationships, yeah, we'll just import it from China and do it as, as mediocre as possible. It's like, it doesn't, it's like, that's not congruent. Like, so right. it's either worth doing first class if you're first class, or write a really nice handwritten note on a piece of steel or a piece of nice paper and, and call it a day. I, th- I see a lot of incongruency. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of people gift at the wrong time or they gift things that, you know, like we send out a quarter million dollars a year worth of gifts to our clients and prospects every year. Um, other companies, you know, do more, but they do all their gifting in the same four weeks time, um, which everybody says they want to be out of, the, out of the box and different and unique. Then don't give a gift with the other 50 competitors that you're trying to compete with. It's the, it's the dumbest thing. Yeah. Um, they give consumables like, and they think that they're doing themselves a favor. Meanwhile, the other person either A, doesn't eat meat or they're on a diet or you know, they, people measure cost per impression. Like if somebody eats it and it's gone in five minutes, your cost per impression might have only been $50, but it was $50 for one impression. Yeah, you, yeah. Give, you, you give something that lasts for 50 years, your cost per impression goes way, way down might be more expensive on the front end, but people don't really think about gifting as strategically as they do every other part of their business. They think it's a, it's a nice to, it's not, it doesn't need to be strategic. And they don't, they don't realize that people make decisions based upon how they feel in business. And gifting is one of those last arts that most people do horrible. So if you just do it like above average, you stand out so far and ahead above that your competitors, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and John, we have to leave some stuff for people to get giftology. So I don't even want you telling this story, but it's a fantastic story um, that of what happened when John met Cameron Harold, and then what happened after uh, their first meeting to their second meeting. So I don't even want you telling the story. You know, you're gonna have to read in giftology. It's worth the for sure worth the read. Um, yeah. on that. So it's the opening chapter of the book. Yeah. It's that story. It's, yeah. uh, it's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's a great one. And um, so giftology, right? So I'm curious of what stories didn't make the book that are powerful because you have so many amazing stories and you can't include all of them. What didn't make it? Um, well, what, what's interesting is a lot of the things that we do gifting wise, we kind of follow a similar playbook. Um, you know, whether we're going after a manufacturer, whether we're going after a food company, I could, I mean, like the, the one, like David Estes, uh, who's a big wig at a, 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 a company, I don't think made the, made, made the cut, but he, you know, he was somebody that I wanted to impress and I sent a gift and I targeted it towards the wife. Like I targeted it towards the inner circle. Yeah. And then I remember being at an event where she came up and she's all like blinged out with diamonds and gold and she's a, just a beautiful woman. And um, she, you would have thought I gave her a brand new car. Like, like she almost made me feel uncomfortable. And I'm used to like, I love the feedback, the positive feedback of right. the praise. And I sent her two knives. But because I put her name on them, and every gift that came into that household always was like branded 
or it was all about golf. His, David's a big golfer. It was finally a gift that included her. And um, I've had that happen no less than a thousand times where people were like, how did you know to do X, Y, and Z for my wife or my assistant or my husband? And I'm like, I knew because you're a human being. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I know because humans eat and entertain and like food. I know because I know people like their name on things, not my logo. Yeah. And so. Like I'm a genius. Like, yeah. Like, like it's not. Yeah. Like people are like, man, you read my mind or you like knew you knew that we needed knives or you knew that we needed like like a leather bag. And I'm like, I didn't know. I just know because like I know human nature. Yeah. And I think a lot of what gifting like a good gifter if you want to scale, there's instances where like the sauna, it was very relevant in the conversation based upon yeah. the conversation we had. Yeah. But there's a hundred others where I, I use the same gift over and over again, but I personalize it to them and the notes all about them and it's all, it's their logo and it's maybe a, I'll put a date on that was important to them. Yeah. But it's the, but it's the same, like, what I learned from Paul early on was you can take the same delivery vehicle and use it a thousand different ways. And to each person, it feels like, you know, the only it's conversation, new. Are, it's new. Um, and so I, I, I found that we don't add a ton of new gifts on a regular basis because we kind of know what works and we want to, mm -hmm. like there's certain commonalities that, um, that there's very few things that meet our 16 kind of criteria of what makes a great gift, which is a challenge because we have some clients that are literally like, after 15 years, they've used our bag of tricks right? and they have the same relationships. And so it's really challenging us to say, holy crap, we got to yeah. like, you know, like we need more of those Cubs custom speaker experiences um, because we're, we, in some cases we've ran out of ideas that really meet our criteria. So what do you do in that case? Like a company comes to you, you've been doing this for a long time. It's their seventh year that they want to send something to their executive suite owners what what does your brainstorming process look like well i mean we you know we ask the, the selves a question um things like what what would they really want and in some cases you know maybe they wouldn't want a gift maybe they we've we've kind of exhausted the gift things and we need to rotate in an experience for their kids mm. um you know i think that we we focus on the tangible gift but it's not the only type of gifting that you can do it just tends to be the weakest part of what most people do most people are like, they get like buying Cubs tickets. They get like taking people out to a nice dinner. And, uh, and so sometimes we'll say like, hey, why, why don't you rent out you know, Wrigley Field and invite your clients with their kids and have an experience at Wrigley Field where they get to run the bases yeah. with their kids and create a memory. Yeah. Now, we may be able to provide a gift that now they, is a, tr a trigger. I call it the tangible trigger that reminds them of that experience. Mm. But even though we don't handle experiential gifting, we know kind of – what works and so we'll help them guide them on if you do want to do a dinner and make it you know a unique experience maybe we have personally monogrammed steak knives at the you know sitting beside every plate so they take home a $500 yeah. set of steak knives with them that reminds them of that steak dinner and makes it different than the other 99 dinners that they're going to go on mm -hmm. or like we're friends and a, a client of ours is the first US master psalm sommeliers there's only 200 of them in the world the first one in the US is a client why don't you bring him in to create a food and wine experience they couldn't buy anywhere else? Yeah. Uh, so it's the best food and wine experience they've ever had. So uh, we go to, we go through the process and say, you know what? Maybe let's uh, let's shelf the, the the tangible gift idea and 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 let's just dial up your other experiences. Yeah. So Caesar's Palace was one of your clients too. Caesar's Is there an Palace. interesting story behind that? Um, well, we landed them through a friend of a friend. We ended up, um, you know, somebody that was out in Vegas that knew somebody. We, we sent some, you know, some cool gifts to the VP of sales. And they came back to us and said, John, we, um, we need some help. We have 20, 20 or 30 sales reps. They can afford what they want. We want to do something cool. And we ended up targeting something for their spouses it's called their emperor's Kind of like the President's Club, but in the in I figured this would be a good story because they probably give away so much other stuff that I was curious of what you brainstormed with them about. Yeah, I mean, in, in that case, it, uh, it wasn't as sexy as you might think. It ended up being their budget was spent more on the trip that they were going on to. Um, but the timing of the gift going to the, the sales rep's home and, say, and saying thank you to the spouse 
um, was was a thing that we've done often, which is um, just the timing of the gift can completely radically change. Like we've done a number of conferences, like mastermind talks, where the spouse gets a gift while the executive's away at this retreat or whatever else. And just the idea of honoring and, and thanking the spouse mm. when they're they're at home holding down the fort, like. And somebody took that playbook and mm. used it on me when I was away at uh, at Mastermind Talks. A gift showed up, uh, and it wasn't Mastermind Talks related, but they knew I was away, and they and and they sent my wife. Um, she's not into flowers, but they sent her the nicest bouquet. It was probably a two hundred dollar bouquet of flowers, hmm. honoring me and thanking her for being like holding down the fort. And then they sent gifts for each of my three kids wow. um, that were personalized. She had talked to my assistant and then my assistant got a gift. The assistant helped orchestrate. My assistant helped orchestrate all this, gave them the inside information. And then five days later, a gift showed up for her and her kids. Um, so oftentimes the timing of the gift when yeah. you're away and your, your wife is ready to kill you because the kids are going crazy. <laughs> Like, yeah, like you, when you can be the hero in that way, it's uh, so we've done that a number of times. And that that timing of the gifts uh, yeah. makes a huge difference. John, so any times where a gift backfired, I mean, oh, tell yeah. because we're talking about a lot of success stories. I'm curious if there's any backfired stories. So I would say on average, one percent of our gifts come back. OK, so if I send out 100 gifts, I'm going to get one back. If you're targeting people cold up to 20% of the gifts can come back. Hmm. What do you mean uh, by come back? Like actually but, someone sent it back? Yeah. Like really? People say, they just send I, don't it want back. This, I don't want this gift or they'll email and say, why are you sending me this? Well, they know that in our DNA, Robert Cialdini talks about like reciprocity. They know that reciprocity works. Yeah. And so the person might be going through a divorce. In one case, it was a university going through a fraud in investigation at the C level, like at, at the presidential level. Um, and so anything showing up all of a sudden, like they were like, they weren't accepting anything. Um, in one case it was an investment fund and they were, it was blowing up. It was like, it was being like a Ponzi scheme type accusation. Mm -hmm. So one of the board members got a gift that was unsolicited. And because of that, you could tell like, um, they were like, I, we understand this might be acceptable, but not for us. And, I, and it was, you know, the backstory, you don't know what's going on in somebody's life. Right. And so what I love is that because up to 20% can come back, it freaks people out so much that they never gift because they think about like the Walmarts of the world that can't even accept a pencil or a cup of coffee. And so they treat everybody the same. And so they don't gift. Um, now, meanwhile, the other 99% of the people that are out there could accept a gift as long as it was tactful and right. you know, you're not trying to bribe or buy somebody's business which we can go into the parameters of what we feel like is a, a acceptable gift based upon certain things. But up to 20% can come back. So we've gotten, we just did a, a target to like 40 or 50 people worth like 100 million or more for a client. And uh, it freaked them out. I told them ahead of time up to 20% could come back. You warned them, but, yeah. But the business development director, who's one of the four partners, literally couldn't sleep because people that were, like he is a smaller community, and some of the people sent the gifts back. But the ironic part is like the C-level person at Nike who got the gift, they gave us wrong information and we engraved the, the ex-wife's name on a set of knives. <laughs> and, and so we, they got an email saying, Re really nice gift, um, but my wife, my current wife doesn't really like, you know, Susie's name on the knives. So if Were they could, saying it like in a joking way? They weren't mad? Yeah, oh, okay. no. But but the person who That's was in charge of following up, like in his mind, he just like was like, this is the worst case scenario. Like, I'm so embarrassed. And I'm like, well, let's take a thousand dollar set. We'll turn it. Let's send him a three thousand dollar set with his his new wife's name on it. And the fact that he responded with an email meant he liked the gift. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's an open door. Like how often do you get into the sea level of Nike? Um and so the other person who's the CFO of this company was like laughing and thinking it's the funny. It is thing. actually more memorable that way. <laughs> Way more memorable. It happened twice on the same campaign. Um, another person was like, I'll probably sit down with you for coffee if you just starting like if you start sending gifts with my new wife's name on it because she likes the gifts. That's um, like a new part of the playbook. Like set, first send knives with ex-wife's yeah, name. And yeah, then, yeah. And then yeah. get an angry call and then send. 
it's yeah so like the leather bag like we've done it with a leather bag and and um mm-hmm. it we sent in that case it was our fault it was to a ceo they sent the bag back and it was it, we and it was our fault we misspelled the wife's name mm-hmm. um but what was interesting is a few other things went wrong during that campaign it was custom leather bags like tote bags for the wives saying you know we have a, a a new bag of tools that we can bring to help you save money, blah, blah, blah. And um, a number of the people, some of them billionaires, hand wrote thank you notes saying, mm. this is the most thoughtful gift we've ever received. Wow. Um, so even when it, like, I, I tell people, we're not like murdering puppies here. Like we're sending, we're sending gifts. Like, <laughs> Who says really, you're murdering puppies? No, but like the, there are times where people are like freaking out because they, they got an email back of somebody saying, we don't want your gift. Mm. And it's like, we still got an email back. Like if you ran into that person at a wine party and they found out you were the person that sent three gifts mm-hmm. that were like $500 each with their wife's name on it, like if that's the worst thing you do in your life is send a nice gift that gets rejected, right. you've lived a pretty right. stellar life. And so you have, but you have to remind people because not everybody's used to rejection. And especially in the gifting department, most people are clueless and they freak, they just, they, they already feel uncomfortable to send gifts to begin with. And so any form of rejection, it's interesting. It, they take yeah. personally. And I, so I have to coach them through. Like, I wouldn't re- even expect you yeah, to do that. That's, that's interesting. It, it's a, the, the higher level you do gifting, the more you have to provide. People are worried. They're worried. They're freaked out. And, and, um, I, but I like it because it means nobody else will go play in that ocean. Yeah, um, it, it, it's it's ours to you know to have. You stand out. Yeah. So you know, John, you spent five years of blood, sweat, and tears on this book, right? Yeah. So what was the hardest part about writing and completing it for you? Um, I think there was some self doubt of like, um, you know, when you're a farm boy and you're like you grow up around like rich people and you're poor, you're like is this book really good enough to like for executives of big companies to read and, and to, uh, and to really apply? Um, are people just being nice when I speak and share some of these ideas? Um, and I think that I'm a, I'm a, I'm actually a decent writer, but to sit down in front of a, a computer and write, like, um, I, I think that, you know, we, we hired book in a box to, to help with the process. And you were, you were actually, part of the inspiration to, to, to hire them. Cause we had a great conversation, you know, for Mixergy and you're asking these great questions. And I'm telling the stories. And you're like, dude, this is the book. Like, yeah, yeah. just like, just do like, tell these stories, share these principles. And I'm like, okay, like I can talk them out. And so I, we, you know, we interviewed, we transcribed them and my, I'm, I'm I found that I was even better at speaking them than I was at, at, at writing them. Yeah. And so then it was just a matter of like going through and editing and polishing and and um, and I think that part of the process of like when you write a, a nice check to somebody and you kind of set that deadline and my business partner's now like if we write you this better check, finish this thing yeah you better freaking finish this and then my wife is like you've been talking about this for five years like yeah get it done already like yeah this is this is who you are yeah um, I think I even said I'm like I'll stay up late with you, John. Let's just get this thing done because it sounded like that you have so many good stories and good principles there. Dude, that was the, honestly like I I can't thank you enough for. No, you're welcome. And I'm not just saying that just because we're on the podcast. Like I literally like I can't um I can't take up a week of his evenings. Like he's already like he's got multiple projects going on. Like I I'm sure we could get it done, but I um but you were the you were that nudge to be like. Okay, Jeremy could do this, but I, I can just hire somebody. <laughs> if this happens and not take advantage of his kindness. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. I'm glad you did it. What else should people know about Giftology that we haven't talked about? Um, well, first off, nothing's held back. I mean, I, I'm sure we'll create a course that that dives into providing more framework. But at the end of the day, like every, I felt like I poured in the best stories that I had into the book. Yeah, um, I did. It's not like I I took 16 of the principles and, and put eight into the first one and held back eight for like the next book or like it's, it's my playbook. It's yeah. what, and it's not just what we've done for clients. It's what I've practiced in my own life for the last 15 years to right. land the 25 pro sports teams. And I think that sometimes when people hear the Cubs and hear some of the fortune 500 companies, they assume that unless they have a half million dollar budget, like the, the, the small entrepreneurs can never afford us. Yeah. 
Um, or they can never afford to, if they want to do it on their own, like this isn't for them. Yeah. And, and I have some clients that will invest five, 10, 15, 20, 50, you know, whatever thousand into to gifting strategies. Um, it's some of my best clients are guys doing four to 20 million in revenue because they're going up against the Goliaths of the world and they, they can't spend a million dollars on a trade show. So they have to get creative with their dollars and yeah. really as much as I like working with, you know, the, the, the fortune 500 companies like a DR Horton, um, I actually enjoy working with the guy who owns the company as much as anybody yeah. that is its own money on the line because they actually appreciate it the most. And they're also willing to risk and do things a little bit crazier than yeah. the, the corporate person who has to like run it by compliance and you know, all these other things. So yeah. I, I like working with yeah. the EO, YPO yeah. guys as much as I like yeah. working with the Fortune 500. So John, you mentioned the craziest thing you did was the sauna. What was the craziest thing you convinced one of the clients to do? Um, well, one of the, uh, just based upon the size and scale of, of, uh, of what we did, the, um, the seed corn company that picked 1,600 prospects you know, most of the time we're picking like a top 50, a top 100, a top 200, you know, occasionally we'll break a thousand when they, when they, when we were able to convince them to more than double the target list and go after 1600 people and to do three gifts in succession mm. going out, going after their, you're their, like a direct response marketing guru <laughs> in some ways. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. never thought of myself as that person cause yeah. it was, it was gifting and it was never cheesy, like, hey, here's a stress ball. Hey, here's a koozie. Hey, here's a, like, they, you know, like, like I love Chet Holmes and I love Ultimate Sales Machine. Uh, the only thing I disagree with him um, on his strategies and, and people that incorporated it is he was all about doing gifts, you know, once a month or once a quarter, but they were cheap gifts. And I always felt like if you're going to take the time to send something to somebody, make it represent you and your brand well. Don't make it a trinket. Right. And so... When I was able to commit somebody to send out 1,600 gifts three times in a row over the course of a month. Wow. Um, in the course of a month? In the course of a month. Wow. Uh, to go after their 1,600 largest prospects. I was like, this is crazy. Like, that was, and that was early on in my and they're career. And they're not cheap gifts, you know, they're. No, they're like, each gift was anywhere from, I mean, the cheapest gifts was like $10, $20, but some of the other ones were like, 40, 50, 60 dollars. So not like sending saunas, but when you're sending 1600 of something three times in a row and they're not even clients yet, it's just to, just to get a conversation started and warm up a conversation. Yeah. That, that's a, and that was 10 years ago. Um, I was like, this works. Like, it's like, and then when I saw the response, like people, instead of like talking to them on the phone for 20 seconds, they were sitting down with them for two hours I was like, oh my gosh, like this could be really, this could be really crazy. So I would say that was, uh, and they were going after farmers, you know, guys farming 10, 20, 30,000 acres of, I'm like, th if this can work with farmers and seed corn businesses, then I'm pretty sure like, you know, Silicon Valley or other, you know, pro sports teams could, you know, th this yeah. is, this is relevant. Yeah. So John, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask what's been the lowest point in the business and then how you push through. Yeah, I would say, well, there's probably two, two low points. One was um, the, the girl's father who mentored me and taught me a lot of these radical generosity principles. When we broke up and she went back with her ex, um, I had the ring ready. Mm. I, thought, I thought I was going to be spending you know, the rest of my life with her back in Ohio. With, you know, with, you know, I, 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 her dad was kind of like a father figure to me. Yeah. And so, so that was like, that was one of those points where I went from like on the top of the world to like sleeping 12, 14 hours a day, not getting out of bed. I blew through all my money. Uh, my assistant at the time actually had to pay for some of my bills because I was like, I, money was that tight. I almost didn't graduate from college. I went from like a 4.0 to like not passing classes. Wow. Um, so that was, that was pretty tough. How did you um, get out of that funk? Because um, you, you seem like someone who that it takes a lot for you to, to get into something like that. Yeah, it was deep. Um, I, I probably similar to a lot of people. Like I, I had a, a mentor guy at the at the Cutco office um, who was like, "Hey, there's this new guy who came in the office. Seems to have a lot of relationships down in the area that you're in, but he has no no business knowledge. 
why don't, why don't you guys team up? Why don't you mentor him? Mm. And um, so we did. And we like he had the relationship. I had the knowledge. And we teamed up and we split all the deals. And we um, me taking the focus off of myself and working mm. with working with him and pouring into him yeah all of a sudden like i i i i kind of like was able to get momentum and kind of mm. rise out, rise out of that that's we amazing had, yeah had best summers ever and so so that was one and then another one was i had sold half the business thinking it was to grow the business and ended up um yeah but i'd invest in real estate and it was about 2007 i invest in commercial invest in other companies and um, mm-hmm. everything started to hit the fan. I, when I sold half the business, we found out that my assistant was stealing from me, um, which was a big blow. But then she was also my accountant, so she was doing my taxes wrong. So I went through an IRS audit, and then the meltdown happened. And so all this real estate started. Like, it all like, just hit it, hit it once. And it, uh, lost um, my, my brother, um, uh, his nephew, or his nephew, his son, my nephew, drowned. Oh, my God. Uh, it was like in the course of six months, everything that could go wrong went wrong. Jeez. To the point where I was like, and I started dating my now wife. Um, and so like I was barely keeping my lips above water. I was living on a thousand dollars a month take home. Uh, my business partner uh, who was brought on to grow the business didn't take a salary for 18 months. Wow. Uh, you know, we were able to avoid filing for bankruptcy, but it was a tough 18 to 24 yeah. months. Um, but without him, if I hadn't sold the business, and I didn't sell 49% of the business. I sold 50% of the business because I felt like if I'm literally going to sell half the business, I want it to be somebody that like, it's almost like a marriage. Like, yeah. you're in it. Yeah. There's no, nobody can trump each other. But without him, the business wouldn't have survived. He was the, he was the one who said, <coughs> John, go focus on relationships. I'll, I'll handle the back end. Mm. Don't worry about it. Like, I don't want to take a salary. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I don't need the money. I'm good. Um, I believe in you. I believe in what we're going to do. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that was back in 2007, 2008. And your wife, you know, tell me about her role at the time and how she helped kind of, you know, that's like one of the toughest points of your life. It sounds like she was, uh, she was a rock. I mean, we, I, I, I would be lying if I didn't say like, we didn't go through some rocky periods, like an entrepreneur when he's ready, almost ready to drown. Like, and I'm just like flailing to try to keep above water. Like she got the worst side of being an, of seeing an entrepreneur. Right. She heard, she heard about the Cameron Harold Brooks brothers story, but she was getting like, like Raymond noodles and like us, us by, you know, going out to dinner, you know, and was splitting dinner. Like she didn't get like the whining and dining and Ritz, you know, the Ritz treatment she got right. like, so the fact that she even just stayed with me, um, and believed that. Like I was worth dealing with all this crap and all this mess and baggage um, is really in retrospect kind of like unbelievable. Like I think most women would be like, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Call me when you got your like crap together. And she was willing to like roll up her sleeves. And like for the first year of marriage, she made more money than I did. Um, Which is okay. Which is a humbling, you know, like. Yeah, it's, it, it, in in retrospect, it is. But at the time, like my ego, mm. like it was, it bruised my ego. Yeah, um, and it was difficult for me to, but it was motivating because I wanted to have a family, and I wanted her, if she wanted to, to be able to stay home with the kids. If she didn't want to, that's fine. Um, but uh, but yeah, she was a rock, man. She was, mm. you know, she was a farm girl. She grew up on a couple thousand acres, hog farm. Like she wasn't afraid to like roll up her sleeves and deal right. with some uh, deal right. with some. Crap. Literally. So literally. <laughs> so John, on the flip side, what's been uh, one of the proudest moments for you? Um, I would say, well, one for, um, well, this book is one of my, is definitely like a, a proud moment. I would say getting the opportunity of being asked to speak at Google um, mm. was, a, was, a, uh, was a huge like. You How know, did that happen? Like, um, I, I got to be a part of a, a faith-based uh, organization that's kind of like Christian business leaders, young Christian business leaders called Marketplace One. Uh, some guys out of Phoenix started it, and and I got to go through a, a class. Um, they have a kind of a class system, and I go back every year to teach the alumni. And one of the guys that heard me speak on the topic of radical generosity in business mm. was a Google, was a Googler, mm. and he he went back and emailed like hundreds of people and said. 
this guy just helped me give the most amazing gift to my wife. Mm. I think we could use his help. Yeah. And, and they said, yeah, we have this event. We think that you should come and speak at it. Wow. And where uh, was the event? Was it in it California? Was, yeah, it was at it was in Mountain View. So it was at wow. their camp. It was at their campus. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, um, unfortunately, they wouldn't let me record it. I would have loved to. Really? Like, yeah, they wouldn't let me. Uh, I, I I figured the you know the, the company owns YouTube. You think would record everything? <laughs> uh, not so much. Not so much. They uh, but uh, was honored to be there yeah. and you know be able to check out the campus. And so speak. what was your experience like there speaking? It was um it was great. I I, I um. I mean, I wasn't like I was there all day. It wasn't like I was like Bill Clinton showing up and giving a keynote to the entire company. It was a breakout at mm-hmm. a at an event. Yeah. Um, but people were really warm and inviting. They were interested, and and I even shared some of the perks and benefits that I give to my company employees, which some of them were like, "Wow, we don't even get that here at Google." Like really? that's pretty. Um, which was also like, you know, I I was like pretty proud that like hell yeah. Yeah. yeah, we were we were doing some things right. So um, what what's one of those things that you mentioned that they were blown away, even though they get free food, massages, and anything else that they want? Yeah, pretty much anything on the planet. <laughs> um, like what, yeah. So one of the things we did early on, we have a lot of moms that work for us, working moms, and they're with kids and and uh, young kids, a lot of them, and um, and so we started years ago, paying to have their house cleaned every other mo- every other week. Hmm. It costs us like that's amazing, yeah, eighteen hundred dollars a week. But what's funny is it has like th- tens of thousands of dollars in value because the husbands are like their lives are easier. The wife, the 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 women are less stressed. That's, yeah, their life goes smoother. It's a and great idea. Wow. Yeah, it's such a simple concept, but um, people are like, how do you afford to do that? I'm like, how do you afford not to? It's like it's a benefit that yeah. most people would. They would love to have. They'd never spend the money on themselves to do it, though. Yeah. And, um, so That's amazing. John, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. I have in my notes the Bubble Banks company. Tell me yeah. about that. So um, it's not as, as much top of mind because it's, uh, you know, as a business owner, you, you think about revenue sources. But it, giving is a core value. Like uh, we, we, we said a long time ago, my business partner, I don't need to start a charity, but we want to be a spotlight in a funnel, we literally said funnel for a cause that mattered before bubble banks was ever in the, in the picture. And so, you know, like when I see something, I just look at things from a different angle. I saw this at a wood shop, this kid's piggy bank that was like kind of like two dimensional and, it, and you were able to feed money into it, into its belly. And I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if we did one like that in the shape of a cow for like Chick-fil-A? Cause McDonald's has the little metal boxes and uh, we ended up testing it in the shape of a cow and we hoped to do a dollar a day. It ended up doing $5 a day. And so we started to we part we found out they were patented. We ended up partnering with a patent owner, uh, mm. John Chestnut, and we started to make not only the metal ones that you see in McDonald's, but we partnered with a guy who used to be at McDonald's that um, collects the money. You know, like, most people don't realize that metal box at McDonald's does thirty million dollars a year in change. Wow, seriously, um, that's amazing. And if you tried to t- could collect like three thousand dollars worth of change and put it in the back of your car. It would break your axle because it weighs like thousands of pounds. So collecting the money is really difficult in a, an efficient way. So we started to build devices and refer out this collection company. Hmm. And so we've helped like Children's Miracle Network, one of the largest children's hospital organizations. We put them into like all the airports across the country. We build the devices. If you go to like an HMS, which runs like Starbucks and those kind of places, we build those devices. And literally like if you add up you know, our partners, like the guy from McDonald's who's collects $30 million a year, like we've, you know, tens of millions so of dollars. You basically help them process that we process more efficiently, it, more efficiently. And we help them create creative devices to put money into them to give to charity. And we, wow. we, we maybe break even. Um, it's not a, it's not like retirement money, but it's for us, it's like, that's money that would end up in like a coffee can at somebody's house like if you can get people yeah and if you make it fun enough kids will like we've seen kids feed fifty dollars worth of money of their mom's purse that has change in the bottom of the purse into these like what is it like what does it look like what kind of what what's the most elaborate bank um like a dinosaur like a big four foot tall blue dinosaur that says feed me 
my money, you know, my money goes to children's hospital or whatever. Hmm. And so they, you know, the kids love watching the money go into the, <coughs> the mouth of the, it feels, it feels like they're feeding the dinosaur, feeding the dog, right. or feeding right, the, right, giraffe, right. The, the cow or the giraffe. And so these, uh, yeah, we have units, you know, thousands of units all over the country. Right. Um, and always looking, anybody that has a retail location where cash might be present or a doctor's office where there's captive audience of with kids, I mean, we can, hmm. ra- we can raise incremental money that's pretty insane for, that's amazing. For, for a charity. Yeah. John, thank you so much. I have one last question for you. But first, um, tell people where, where can they go and get Giftology? Where can they check you out? Yeah. So if they go to, they can go to Giftology Book. Uh, Giftologybook.com. So- book.com okay. they, can go to, they can go to rulinggroup.com to check out some case studies and you know some some of the strategies that we employ yeah uh, um, they can follow me on twitter you know at rulin uh facebook i mean all the kind of the normal places yeah and rulin uh, group is r-u-h-l-i-n and then group g-r-o-u-p.com um and i will be getting an audible when you come out with the audio version even though i've already read it i always like listening to it as well um yep. last question john um who are some of the companies and entrepreneurs you want as a client in case someone listening knows them um who, who's on your uh list right now yeah so i've had conversations with gary vaynerchuk but i have not landed him as a client because you're in um, one of his videos i am i, I mean I, you're everywhere i'm like watching a gary v video and then i'm like wait i think that's john right there. right that, yeah yeah, the, he came to St. Louis and was meeting with Andy Frazella, and I, you know, bought some books, and we were supposed to meet up, and um, ended up buy, you know, buying a bunch of food for him, waiting in his room, and he's like, "Why don't you just come hang out with me for the night?" And of course, like, I, I was a fly on the wall. Like, he's there to add value to Andy Frazella's company, uh, the supplement company, and so we didn't really get a chance to chat. He's like, "Hey, look, meet meet with me when in New York," but you know, he's somebody that gives, 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 adds value. And I think that um, he could leverage the gifting side. A couple of the gifts that we've given him, like the Lego. You've yeah. Seen, like the, the Lego. That's one of our clients. Yeah. Chris Green has a testimonial video for, about you on, and how he sent this like exact replica Lego, right, of the Gary yeah. Vee set. Yeah. yeah. So, so he would be uh, somebody that, that we know as acquaintances, but I'd love to, have a, I'd love to be a partner of theirs for them and their, their clients. Yeah. Uh, Tim Ferriss, um, I think, um, you know, would really appreciate what we, what we do and what we teach around habits and, and I think gratitude. I mean, he was a big supporter of the five minute journal, which is great. Yeah. Um, but most people don't know how to take action on their gratitude. Um, yeah. and then I would say I've corresponded with Seth Godin. I haven't, I, and he always responds, but, um, but I have, and, and he's a big fan of, of Cutco. One of our clients sent him knives and he's like, these are almost too sharp to use and, and, um, and he uses them he all shaves the time. his head with them or? <laughs> no, <laughs> exactly um, and I would say Michael Hyatt is another person I respect and follow from afar um, I know Stu McLaren does some stuff for him I, but I haven't asked for any favors there to yeah to get but I, I really respect his platform and and who he is you know from a faith perspective I think we would really resonate and connect with so those are some people that I'm yeah that are, that are on my radar hopefully uh, giftology will end up in their hands yeah. um, so if anyone has a um any ideas on that um contact john or actually forget john just contact them directly and see what you can do for john because he's always giving to other people so john i really appreciate it this has been fantastic thank you so much jeremy thanks man for having me this has been awesome i yeah. can't believe the time went by that I, fast i know i know take care Between my eyes, walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.